Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror and Mortal Kombat media, because I like it. That's why today, for our very first video game Kill Count, I'm looking at, well, Mortal Kombat, released in 2011 and also known as Mortal Kombat 9. Don't worry, I'll explain. Everything. This show has already covered the three live-action adaptations of Mortal Kombat, and if you watched those episodes, you know I'm a lifelong fan of this ultra-violent video game series. The first three games, including Ultimate 3 and MK Trilogy, were mainstays of my childhood, thus why they get special Kill Count privileges, despite not being horror. Though I still may maintain their neighbors to the genre. I mean, this one has Freddy Krueger as a DLC character. With the strikes going on, I figured I could take a wild swing and try covering the game series, because these aren't merely simple fighting games. The Mortal Kombat storyline is a long, convoluted, hot mess of a good time, featuring an absurd amount of characters who are all mostly able to stand out, for one reason or another. Technically, the story has been unbroken since Midway released the first game 30 years ago in 1992. Of course, back then, the plot was relayed in big chunks of text on screen. You'd learn more if you managed to beat the game, no easy feat that, but to really get a grasp on the lore back then, you'd have to turn to the official comics. Even when the franchise got to the 3D era, with the trilogy I never played of Deadly Alliance, Deception, and Armageddon, the stories were still confined to text, although at least at that point they had overly dramatic narration. Once again, the threat to Earthrealm has been vanquished. The Deadly Alliance is no more. I imagine most players skipped all these words and got straight to the button mashing. If the text screen delivery style wasn't bad enough already, MK's story is also confusing and sometimes contradictory. I already mentioned the ass load of characters. Their alliances are constantly shuffling as they fight and are killed and get brought back to life. That kind of impermanence usually turns me off and is one of my gripes with superhero stuff, but it works for me in Mortal Kombat because it's so ridiculous. And for the most part, the games know they're ridiculous. This is a series that has always been violent to the point of absurdity. Clearly, there's a sense of humor here, even in the infamously bloody fatalities. The games quickly introduced more comical finishing moves, like babalities and all those silly friendships. Friendship. Friendship. Mortal Kombat 9 introduces its own new game mechanic called the X-Ray, a hilariously over-the-top combination attack. These attacks are like something Art the Clown would do, and they don't even finish the fight every time. You can come back and win from this. <laughs> More importantly though, MK9 serves as a soft reboot of the story, which is why it was released simply as Mortal Kombat. It does it in a genius way, technically continuing the story, kind of like the 2009 J.J. Abrams Star Trek film. The beginning of the game sends us back through time, and you play through a slightly altered version of the original trilogy. This time, instead of text dumps, though, you get two full hours of cutscenes, complete with voice acting and, well, way too booby of female characters. Seriously, every single one of them is just jiggling up and down the screen. In those fucking outfits, too. Sonya Blade is supposed to be a special forces soldier, not a stripper cop. Regardless, the important thing is that the story is no longer confined to end screens and wikis. With Mortal Kombat 9, everyone gets to experience the plot in a modern cinematic rendition, but at the same time, with a few significant changes to keep the longtime fans surprised. In this kill count, I'll mostly be sticking to the story. I'm not a professional gamer who can speak to fighting mechanics or how balanced things are, and to be frank, I don't really care about that stuff. I ain't playing MK competitively. I'm playing it to watch a stupid silly story with a ton of cool characters who are gonna rip each other's bodies apart. When it comes to that criteria, MK9 is hella satisfying, and I hope that after this video, some of you can see the fun in the franchise too. In a series best known for its ultra-violent kills, how many will there be among the combatants? Combatants with a K. Everything's spelled with a K in Mortal Kombat. Let's find out and get to them. The game begins with a little birdie. Aw, that's now- Oh my god, everyone is dead! This is the fallout of a scene shown in Mortal Kombat Armageddon, the seventh game in the series that I've never played at all. If you're wondering why this game, MK9, picks up after the seventh one, it's because the eighth was Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe, but that game's storyline takes place in a sort of standalone timeline, unconnected to the story told throughout the other games. This tapestry of carnage with a K gives us 33 dead characters, all strewn about the pyramid of 
Vargas. Scorpion can no longer get over here. Baraka's had a hatastrophe. Johnny Cage has lost his cool guy glasses, and Sonya Blade has lost her cool gal legs. Shiva's been stuck with a green energy arrow from Nightwolf, staying true to the events of Armageddon, and Kung Lao's been hugged a bit too hard by Shinnok. The only two still living combatants are the Elder God Raiden and his Elder Ass Kicker Shao Kahn. As he tosses Raiden like an elder baby, his amulet falls and shatters on the ground. Shao Kahn says it's hammer time, and Raiden knows his goose is cooked. He decides to use his shattered amulet as a payphone to the past, but he's only got enough change to say one thing. He must win. With that, he gets Shao Kahn. And though we don't see it happen, I'm still counting him as dead. Now we're soaring and flying through Raiden's memories. There's not a game in MK's past that we can't reach. Oh, but maybe just uh, keep flying past Special Forces. No thank you. Instead, we're going all the way back to the first game, where Shang Tsung has gathered combatants for a tournament on his mystery island. Raiden gets the message from his future self in the form of his present amulet cracking. It is nothing, Liu Kang. Yeah, okay, bullshit. Raiden is voiced by Richard Epcar, who's no stranger to fighting games. Having voiced fighters in DOA, Street Fighter, Soul Calibur, and Tekken 7, as well as The Joker and Injustice, another NetherRealm series that spun off from MKVDCU. Epcar also voiced Raiden in that game, as well as in MKX and MK11, and his is probably my favorite depiction of Raiden across all Mortal Kombat media. Sadly, it doesn't look like he'll be returning for MK1. Shang Tsung gives his usual Shang spiel. He's here on behalf of Shao Kahn, Scary Skull Mask Guy, who's the ruler of Outworld, which he wants to merge with Earthrealm, which is, you know, Earth. The only legal way to do that, according to the laws of the Elder Gods, is to win 10 Mortal Kombat tournaments in a row. Outworld's already won 9, so if Earthrealm loses this one, it's about to be hammer time all the time from London to the Bay. Earthrealm's fighters include the guy who worships Raiden, Liu Kang, a Shaolin monk. There's also Special Forces agent Sonya Blade, who's definitely not on a deep cover mission since she's walking around with her thangs be thangin'. That attracts Johnny Cage, famous actor. Massive Strike, Citizen Cage, Ninja Mime. Don't knock Ninja Mime! We see later they had a pervasive marketing campaign. Wonder if any of those billboards are for your consideration. Cage doesn't really know what's going on here, but Shang Tsung chooses him as the first combatant. So, who's he gonna face? Reptile! Of fucking course, Outworld's resident jobber. Reptile, real name Sizoff, is a Saurian, a descendant species of Earthrealm dinosaurs who went to live in another realm, which Outworld eventually conquered. Reptile served his new rulers loyally, but in practice, dude's always the first fight and always loses. It's kind of sad, especially since it was such a pain in the ass trying to fight him in the first game. It had to be your sixth pit trip with a blimp moon shadow combined with no blocking and a double flawless victory with a non-stage fatality. That sounds like a joke, but no, that is the actual process you needed to do to fight him. How the mighty have fallen. Cage puts the lizard man down, as well as Baraka, another one of Outworld's low carters. He's a Tarkadin, who are sharp toothy boys, and he looked ridiculous in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Shang Tsung tells Johnny to kill Baraka, but despite the peer pressure, Cage refuses. Very well. The tournament! we we'll resume at dawn. What? You can just say no? I guess it makes sense in Attorney, where the contestants enter to plight applause. <laughs> Cage makes friends with Raiden and Lou, then sets out to pester Sonya. I specialize in rescuing damsels in distress. She tells the greasy D-bag to fuck off, and we have to use our greasy D-pad to fight her, which is, you know, kinda messed up. Then freaking Kano arrives, and the nasty Ozzy 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 hits Cage with an impromptu pit fatality. <laughs> Johnny survives and fights him off. Throw that on your Barbie. Shrimp. This Barbie shrimp is head of the Black Dragon Crime Syndicate, and he's been selling weapons to Outworld. That's pretty much all Kano does, but we love him in this house. Great voice performance by Michael McConaughey, who would reprise the role in MKX. After he defeats Kano, Sonya instantly forgives Cage as the slightly less despicable man in her life. Sonya searches for Jax, her commanding officer who's held prisoner somewhere on this island. She passes the Out Body Worlds exhibit, giving us two more to add to the count, then finds Jax stuck behind bars. Before she can help him, she Shang Tsung shows up, flanked by guards and Yin Yang Kitsune masks. They look just like they did in the first game, standing in front of all those plight spectators. Raiden appears and blinds all those mofos, allowing Sonya to free Jax with her energy bracelets. They're able to get to a waterfall evac area worthy of a Jurassic Park film. Unfortunately, someone doesn't endorse the park, and the chopper gets fireballed out of the sky. Not sure how many people were in there, so I can only count one for the pilot. I'll call him Steve to humanize him. Bye, Steve! That stinger came from Shang Tsung, who laughs at 
at Sonya and parades his gang past her. Kano, Katana, and Jade, the latter two Adanians. More on them later. Cage and Raiden find the stranded Special Forces units, and the Lightning God heals Jax with lightning? That's amazing. No, that's bullshit. Raiden tells everyone about the visions he's had from the future, Shao Kahn conquering Earthrealm, and everyone here becoming vulture food. I believe these flashes are a guide to defeating Shao Kahn but disrupting the flow of time can have serious consequences. Boy, will they. He says they must fight in the tournament and win. He can't, though, since he's an elder god and ain't allowed to interfere. The next day, his flashes help him discover an undercover Kung Lao, another Shaolin monk currently disguised as an Ilvis man. Kung Lao's jelly of Liu Kang, the Shaolin golden boy, so he offers to fight Scorpion, an undead ninja whose name was once Hanzo Hasashi. Scorpion kicks his ass without even really wanting to. He's here for revenge. I demand Sub-Zero! He wants to fight the Ice Ninja Sub-Zero, real name Bihan, because his clan of assassins, the Lin Kuei, murdered Scorpion and all the rest of his family and clan, the Shirai Ryu. This was depicted in the amazing opening sequence in the 2021 film. But Raiden has a vision that if Scorpion kills Subby, bad things will happen. Noob things. He makes a deal with Scorpion not to do it. Spare Sub-Zero's life, and I will request that the Elder Gods return the Shirai Ryu to the realm of mortals. Wait, what? Again? You can just do that? To get to Sub-Zero, Scorpion's gonna have to go through his Lin Kuei condiment friends, Mustard Cyrax, and Ketchup Sector. He dresses them down and earns the fight he really wants against Bihan, who's always just... He's, he's so frosty, like, all the time. He's, like, actively sublimating. Scorpion takes the fight to the Nether Realm, another one of the six main realms. It's basically hell. Scorpion's comfy down here, since he's a revenant. After Bihan killed him, he was brought back to life by Quan Chi, that cool looking sorcerer with the deep voice. Scorpion, kill him. Quan Chi reminds Scorpion that the Lin Kuei massacred the Shirai Ryu. And while I like this art style, I'm gonna skip counting any of these kills. Feels a bit too abstract for me, like Scorpion was reading about it in a book or something. But it's still real the Scorpion, damn it! So he reveals his bastard skelly face and kills Sub Zero off screen? What? Looks like he burned Bihan down to the bone, then ripped his head off. Raiden's not mad at you, Hanzo. He's just disappointed. Cyrax is upset about the murder of his ninja mate, but Raiden tells him to chill out, because the Lin Kuei kinda suck. They're fighting for Outworld even though they're from Earthrealm. Betraying your own realm? I expect better even from an assassin. Oh, also, their leader wants to turn them all into robots. It's called the Cyber Initiative. To test Cyrax's loyalty to Outworld, Shao Kahn has him fight Johnny Cage. When Cyrax wins, he's told the usual. Finish uh, him! Uh, but a grumpy god shake from Raiden makes him grant mercy to the Cagester. Very little finishing going on here. They must not have the issue of Nintendo power with the fatality codes. This disobedience upsets Cyrax's superior, Sector, a prominent cheerleader of the Cyber Initiative. Cyrax is not, so they fight about it. And while Cyrax wins this fight, he won't win the war. Raiden has another flash of his future self's cryptic message. He must win. He decides it's Liu Kang who must win, but to do so, he'll have to get through Ermac first. Ermac's a weird soul Frankenstein of multiple dead guys. We are many. You are one. We will destroy you. Liu Kang kicks his ass though, or kicks their asses, earning the attention of Kitana. She's the Adanian princess fighting for Outworld on behalf of her father Shao Kahn, scary skull mask guy. She loses her spar against Liu, but they'd definitely be flirting while they beating each other down. You're good. Show me more. I mean, not too much more she can show in that outfit, but she will speak to him in her love language. Do it. Do what? Kill me. Ha, it's true what they say. Men are from Earthrealm, and women are from Outworld. Liu chooses not to kill her, which in this game series is the start of a romantic storyline. Liu Kang's the last Earthrealm combatant, but he's still gotta fight Goro. What's a Goro? Goro's the reigning champion of Mortal Kombat, and to fight him, you gotta go through Goro's hole. Liu's pooped out of the Goro hole into a dungeon, where he meets Goro, the four-armed prince of the Shokan and forever fan favorite. I mean, how couldn't he be? He looks terrifying in the first game. There, he was portrayed by a stop-motion figure, while everyone else was played by actors using mocap. No, I didn't mean that mocap. No one ever means that mocap. I meant motion-captured actors, like all these badasses. Liu Kang defeats Goro almost as quickly as friggin' Cole Young, and returns to the throne room so he can face the real final challenge, Shang Tsung himself. Though the sorcerer is a shapeshifter and much more agile than you might expect for his age, Liu Kang wins, officially ending the tournament and saving Earthrealm. Yay! Earthrealmers rejoice! Yeah, Outworlders, y'all get out of here! You and your booty 
cheeks. Clap, clap, clap. This is where the storyline for the first Mortal Kombat ended, but it's not the end here, since Raiden's amulet is still clapping. Or cracking, sorry. That means he's still gotta find a way to change the future. Right after this Star Wars ceremonial celebration, where the Shaolin monks sit on the coolest platform ever made. Let's hear it for that platform. So polite, all the background folk in this game. I think it's safe to say that Mortal Kombat 9 saved the franchise. Yes, a round of applause indeed. While the 3D era has its fans, most people were disappointed with Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe, since it was rated teen and thus was mostly bloodless. I mean, Warner Brothers wasn't gonna let Superman get his spine ripped out. Midway, the company that made every Mortal Kombat game, filed for bankruptcy mere months after MKVDCU's release. Thankfully, when Warner Brothers bought the IP, they also kept on a lot of Midway's team, who rebranded as NetherRealm Studios. They got more money, better offices, and most importantly, more time to spend developing the game, and they used it wisely. They went back to a mature rating and reinstituted all the blood while carrying over all the good things from MKVDCU, like its story mode. Mortal Kombat 9 was a monster hit, and I love that it allowed a team of developers to make a successful comeback. Shao Kahn gets shouty at Shang Tsung for dang losing. 500 years I have waited. Now I must wait 500 more. Just to be the man who waits a thousand years to conquer your home world. <laughs> The sorcerer tells Shao Kahn he's got another idea. First, he's gotta get all young and sexy. The character's appearance changed like this in Mortal Kombat 2 when he became a playable character. It changed again in Mortal Kombat 3 when he became Alice Cooper. Shang Tsung Mark De tells Raiden they about to have one more tourney. The last one, he swears. If Outworld wins, it'll merge with Earthrealm, obviously. But if Earthrealm wins, Shao Kahn will stop trying to take it over. Forever. Like, seriously. He swears. Raiden doesn't agree at first, so Shang Tsung opens a portal to Outworld. Let's start a war! Start an inter-realm war! With our Katens! 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 The toothy turds do quite the number and kidnap Sonya Blade off screen. In the process though, 22 of them get killed in the battle, along with five Shaolin monks I see lying around dead in the background. Raiden has a vision of Liu Kang winning this new tournament, but since fulfilling the vision last time didn't stop his amulet from crackalacking, he reasons these visions might be of things he has to stop from happening. Perhaps he must win refers to another. And perhaps your uh, hat is kinda dumb. Raiden agrees to the new rules and they head to the tourney, which will be held in Outworld. Jax just comes along to find Sonya, but now that he's here, might as well compete. Jackson Briggs, you will face Baraka. Oh, no worries, man. You'll be back looking for Sonya in no time. Raiden's already having visions of her in his next MK fan fiction. They wind up looking for her in, uh, Mustafar, I think, where they have a quick fight with the Adanian Jade. When the cameraman refuses to rack focus away from her rack, we cut away to Sonya being held captive by Shiva, a Shokan, like Goro, who's loyal to the Adanians, including Princess Katana and the Cleavage Canyon known as Jade. Adania was one of the six main realms and corresponds to Eden, you know, like the garden variety. Unfortunately for them, Edania was merged with Outworld after Shao Kahn won 10 Mortal Kombat tournaments in a row. Edanians look like humans, but are descended from gods and age much slower. Katana is like 10,000 years old, the friggin' cougar. <laughs> Jax attacks the guards in the Deadpool stage, which made its first appearance in Mortal Kombat 2. Here, it has two dead guys chained up in the background, who I'll count. I'll also count one of these weird, fleshy Gamorrean guard guys who jacks American gladiators into the inconvenient acid pool, which was a stage fatality you could do in MK2. Then he defeats Shiva, which allows him to save Sonya from the entity. Sub-Zero's back, hanging out with a smoky Lin Kuei ninja named, well, Smoke. God, standing next to these two probably feels like you're in a theme park dark ride. But wait a minute, Sub-Zero died! We saw it, kinda. That was OG Subby Bihan. This is Bihan's younger brother, Kwai Liang, who's taken the name over so he can be Subby Subby 2! Sub-Zero and Smoke are trying to learn what happened to Bihan. Maybe check below the 37 goddamn bodies in the background. Oh man, I didn't think this would be like the purge. Thanks, Josh. Smoke finds Kano selling rocket launchers to Shang Tsung, a guy who we've already seen has fireballs. So like, why are you spending your money, dude? Smoke kicks Kano's ass in a forest where eight dead bodies can be seen in the background. That includes one guy who's become a snake nest we'll see again later. So don't complain I missed him when we get there. Smoke's victory is short-lived since he gets an invisible beating courtesy of a cyborgified sector. He's here to spread the good word of the cyber initiative. You will return with us to begin your transformation. You actually did it. 
You're a cyborg. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that cyborg is defeated, but Smoke's still about to become an e-cigarette. Raiden sees a vision of it, and fans know that's what happened to him during the original timeline. Raiden interferes this time, killing Smoke's six would-be captors and seriously voiding their warranties. Yes, cyborgs count. They're mechanized people, okay? Thanks to Raiden, Smoke is still a ninja, albeit probably one who smells like cigars. Sub-Zero also finds a cyber Lin Kuei, and it's tragically Cyrax, who didn't even want to become a robot man in the first place. Subby Z beats him up, then runs into Sonya and Jax, who tell him his brother Bihan was killed by Scorpion. Dun dun dun! All of a sudden, Ermac comes out of a portal all pissed off, and uses his creepy dead guy magic to freaking burst Jax's arms apart! That shit is so much more than just a flesh wound! Jax didn't have metal arms during his premiere in Mortal Kombat 2, but he had them for the third game, where they were bionic enhancements he voluntarily wore over his regular arms. This was also the case in MK Annihilation. But elsewhere, their replacement arms, like in a comic where Baraka cut them off, or in the 2021 film where Sub-Zero shattered them apart, or in the animated feature Scorpion's Revenge where Goro rips them off, which might be the coolest way for them to go. Sub-Zero finds Shao Kahn and demands to face his brother's killer, so Quan Chi does that voodoo that he do so well and brings out the Scorpion King. The Ice Ninja defeats the Revenant and is about to put him down for good when Cyber Lin Kuei show up and subdue Subby. Sector and Cyrax lead the charge and take him away. Princess Katana gets in trouble with her dad because she doesn't kill this bald dude she defeats in combat with a K. Wait, is that Arlene? I don't know, but Shao Kahn does his daughter's homework for her and offs the guy himself. Huh, <laughs> kids. Raiden sees this familial conflict and tries to take advantage of it. Go to Shang Tsung's flesh pits. Much will be revealed there. Damn Ray, ma'am. Ain't even buy her dinner and you already trying to take her to the flesh pits? She takes his advice and walks boobily through the forest from Wizard of Oz. But her friend Jade tries to stop her, saying she should be a loyal daughter to their Emperor Shao Kahn. One friendly ass beating later, Katana gets past Jade and makes her way into the flesh pits. She finds a bunch of ladies in tubes, and they ain't Ripley clones, they're naked toothy ladies. Clothe me. Clothe me. One of them is cold and shamed, lying naked on the floor. She looks like me. I mean, I guess, but why would that be? Sister. <gasps> oh, duh, that's right. This chick is Katana's sister. It's Molina, a fan favorite. And not just because she's totally butt-ass naked here. She's also unhinged and a lot of fun. Come, let us be a family. Katana defeats her and learns that Shang Tsung is responsible for creating this half Tarkadian half clone. He did so on the orders of Papa Shaka Khan, who tells Katana he ain't her real dad. Your father was a weakling, a Dingian king. I annihilated him while merging his realm with Outworld and took his queen as my wife. I can't tell if she already knew this or not. Katana is taken away and Jade realizes maybe the Emperor isn't a good guy. She tries to free Katana but gets run out of the place and attacked by Melina on the beach. Melina may have slightly more clothes on now, but don't worry, the game's still gonna give us that boob shot. God, Jade probably didn't even have to fight her. Just tip her over, she's so fucking top heavy. Raiden and his lightning lads down up onto the beach where the jaded Jade lends her booty brush and ponytail to their cause. Liu Kang learns that Katana is being held prisoner by Shao Kahn, strung up like Sonya and Kano were in this stage in Mortal Kombat 2. Liu's too distracted to fight in the tournament, so Raiden gives the go-ahead to Kung Lao. He's told he has to fight in a sorcerer handicap match against Shang Tsung and Quan Chi. No Earth Realm boy stop this deadly alliance. That's a reference to the fifth Mortal Kombat, Deadly Alliance, which had a plot where these two work together. The storyline mode wasn't quite as cinematic, though. Kung Lao wins that fight, then has to go through the secondary boss, Kintaro, who's basically a kitty cat Goro. <coughs> Kung Lao beats Peter Chris Oro and gets cocky, which is what I've always liked about the guy. You see, Raiden? Earthrealm is free! And now he's dead, killed by a surprise neck snap courtesy of Shao Kahn. Kung Lao, more like Kung Ao, am I right? <laughs> Poor Kung Lao's always been a punching bag of the series. He was blasted by Shao Kahn in MK3, killed by the Deadly Alliance in Deception, soul sucked in the 2021 movie, and ripped in half in the animated film. Fatality. At least he dies with variety, unlike his ancestor the Great Kung Lao, who always just gets murdered by Goro. Liu Kang kidney tackles Shao Kahn and they have their climactic showdown. Of course, Liu wins and uses his Shaolin monk powers to Kung Pao Shao Kahn, entering his fist into the dude's torso. This counts as a kill as far as I'm concerned. I mean, look at all that mouth blood. Kerplunk. Once again, Outworld is a bunch of Lehu's the thanks to Lehu Kahang. 
And sure, Kung Lao may have died, but at least Lu got the girl. And the amulet's fixed. Or wait, no it's not. Well, at least Lu got the girl. The Mortal Kombat 2 story is over now, so we can start MK3s, which sees the return of Shao Kahn, who did die, but has been resurrected by Quan Chi. Even though Outworld lost the 10th Mortal Kombat tournament, and then the winner takes all, swear to God's final final tournament, Quan Chi says they should just invade Earthrealm anyway. It might anger the Elder Gods, but Shao Kahn says fuck them gods. Only problem is, his ex-wife Sindel died casting a spell that prevents him from invading other realms. Quan Chi says dead people are his specialty. Hell, he brought Bihan back as Noob Saibot. That's that Shadow Ninja hanging out right there. Quan Chi does the same with Sindel, Queen of Adania and true mother to Princess Katana. He turns her from a bastard skelly into a naked desert milf. She's now loyal to Shao Kahn and agrees to remove her magic realm protection spell. The invasion of Earthrealm can now begin. It does, with a fight on the streets of the creatively named Earthrealm City. There are a number of casualties here, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 16, 17. Whoa, 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 Striker. I don't pay you to count. I pay Josh to count. What's the number, good buddy? 12. Thanks. Wait. Where's my shirt? You heard him. 12 background bodies dot the streets and thus can be added to the count. All that death and these big fuckers, I don't even know what they are, are bad news for Earthrealmers like SWAT officers Curtis Stryker and Cabal. After defeating the usual Outworld appetizer, they see Melina standing there with her ass out. God, that outfit looks even worse when everyone around her's in full tactical gear. Stryker defeats Melina, but still doesn't understand what's going on. Johnny Cage fighting a giant monster? What is this, Time Smashers? No, but it is Mataro Smashers, since Raiden kills the Centaurian here. It's confirmed when they get back to Outworld later. This is Raiden stopping Johnny Cage's original death, as he saw in one of his visions. Cage was actually killed and brought back a whole bunch of times in the original timeline. It was kinda dumb. In any case, I'm bummed by Mataro's kill. I know he's got some naysayers, but I've always loved the scary secondary boss of MK3. I was bummed about his shitty depiction in Annihilation, and he doesn't even get a single line in this game? What gives? Instead, we get a second appearance from Kintaro that nobody asked for, who uses his magical fire breath to flame the maiden fair. By which I mean Cabal, whose skin is horribly burnt. Is anyone's power, uh... Aloe Vera? Stryker is able to beat Kintaro, then has to face Ermac in a subway. He must break out the bola time or something, since this human cop uses his human cop weapons to defeat an undead ninja made of a bunch of souls. Stryker is approached by Nightwolf, an Earthrealm warrior of the fictional Matoka tribe. They agree to be friends, but Stryker fails his critical role when he looks for Cabal's burnt body. His partner's been taken to Outworld by that nasty Ozzy bastard Kano. Burned to a crisp you were. Good thing I found you. Cabal used to be a member of Kano's Black Dragon Criminal Empire, and Kano has saved him with a gas mask and, uh, pigtails, hoping to get him on their side again. I like that Kano and Cabal's relationship was touched on in the 2021 movie. It made for some great profane dialogue. This Cabal doesn't want to be a bad guy, though, and demands to see Shao Kahn in person. When they get to his throne room, they watch as the Emperor saps away Shang Tsung's soul to give to his resurrected rewife, Sindel. Damn, Khan, pleasure in your lady with another guy? Whatever y'all are into, I guess. Cabal's attempt to approach Shao Kahn runs into various difficulties, so he uses his newfound super speed to catch the nearest portal back to Earthrealm. There, he runs into Cyber Sub-Zero, a never-before-seen version of the character. When Raiden changed the timeline and saved Smoke, from becoming a cyborg, he inadvertently caused Kwai Liang to fall to the Cyber Initiative instead. Smoke and Raiden aren't pleased about that, so they reprogram Sub-Zero to be on their side again. Wonder how many Dweemer cogs it took. Cyber Subby agrees to return to Outworld undercover, but Sector sniffs him out like right the fuck away, and tries to fight him in that subway station. Sub-Zero wins and looks at Sector's hero's path to learn where the Outworld bullies are. Kano, quit lasering the hostages, you dick! Sub-Zero shows up and freezes all ten arms of the oppressors, then and freeze the Earthrealm soldiers before the bad guys thaw out. After defeating Hobbs and Gora, he makes it to a graveyard where Quan Chi is casting a, no shit, Soul Nado. What did you see? One of Shao Kahn's Soul Nados. Sub Zero knows how shitty blank Nado things tend to be and goes to stop it when he's intercepted by Noob Saibot. This is his brother Bihan, brought back from the dead by Quan Chi. You and I both 
We are flawed copies of our former selves. They fight, and Cyber Subby stops his Cyberobot. By the way, the stupid ass name Noob Cybot comes from reversing Boone and Tobias, the surnames of Mortal Kombat co creators Ed Boone and John Tobias. Quan Chi still tries to cast that Soul Nader, but Nightwolf stops him and kicks Bihan into that green party. The sorcerer bails with a blast, escaping while, frankly, really disrespecting the people buried there, okay? Nightwolf reports back to the good guys, but once you know it, this still ain't fixed the future according to the Achy Breaky Amulet. Raiden's furious that nothing is working, so he takes Liu Kang to go talk to the other Elder Gods. As soon as they're gone, the Cyber Lin Kuei appears, so they can have a bunch of all-out NINJA FIGHTS! <laughs> When the Biofreaks battle is over, I can count 15 or so bodies lying around. But those include Cyrax and Sector, who definitely aren't dead, so I can't conclusively say anyone else is either. Oh, except this cyborg, whom Katana decapitates with a fan. If you want kills to count, don't worry, cause Sindel is here, screaming her goddamn lungs out. The resurrected Sindel is simply OP in this game, since she faces down a series of strangely weak attacks from these Earth Realmers who fight her one at a time. Not only that, she winds up killing killing pretty much all of your faves. And Stryker! She tells Jax to heal, kicks Smoke in the crotch, and snaps his neck before his man pain can even start, and finally rips out Jade's stomach. Lily Mumster then beats the crap out of her daughter Kitana, having lost all sense of self after getting back with her ex. Shao Kahn has resurrected me. You have betrayed him. She starts to sap away Katana's life with purple magic when Nightwolf interferes and stops her with blue magic. Uh, blue's better. Go blue? Sindel regains the upper hair, but when she goes for the kill, Nightwolf uses his I'm Rubber, Your Glue powers to reflect it back onto her, killing them both in the same surge of energy. Hair today, gone tomorrow. Raiden and Liu Kang beg the Elder Gods to stop Shao Kahn's invasion, but they say they can't because technically, he's not breaking any rules. Invasion, invasion is not itself a transgression. It is the merger of realms that is prescribed. A distinction without a difference! The giant heads are a giant disappointment, so the monk and the lightning god return to an absolute mess. Lou finds a mortally wounded Katana, who lets him know she was a big fan of his before dying from the damage inflicted by her mom. They are dead. I know, dude. They got kill graphics and everything. And with Raiden's time cookie still crumbling, Liu Kang has lost all faith in the lightning god. What is next, Raiden? Tell me the future! How do we honor their sacrifice? Wow, attitude much? Since everyone is dead, except for Sonya and Johnny for some reason, Lou dismisses Raiden as an elder fool. The Ansem God becomes a seeker of darkness and visits Quan Chi in the fiery nether realm. Raiden asks him to align with Earth Realm, promising him the souls of all the fallen combatants. But Quan Chi laughs it off. He's already got them souls, thanks to an agreement he made with Shao Kahn. Dun dun dun. Wait, how are Raiden and Shao Kahn able to use other people's souls as tender? Is this some kind of multi-level soul marketing scam? Raiden has to fight some of the revenants off, including an angry and somehow even boobier Katana. Quan Chi tells him Shao Kahn's about to merge Outworld with Earthrealm, which makes Raiden realize that if he does, he will finally, officially violate the rules of the Elder Gods. He must win. He determines that the he who must win is Shao Kahn himself, a plan of action Liu Kang thinks is insane. That is insane. See? What's really insane is that Raiden didn't send a clearer message back in time. Couldn't have just said Shao Kahn must win? That extra syllable worth all the confusion, dude? Shao Kahn makes his entrance into Earth Realm, and when Liu Kang goes to fight him, Raiden thunderclaps back with lightning. They face off, and the combination of their fire and lightning powers consumes Liu Kang's body, and actually kills Mortal Kombat's main character. Raiden asks for forgiveness, but Liu Bicycle kicks him while he's down. You have killed us all. Oh. Damn, that's cold. Johnny Cage and Sonya are helpless to stop Shao Kahn, so, you know, good thing they survived. Raiden doesn't even bother fighting. He just wants the prophecy to be fulfilled. Khan beats him back and forth between this timeline and the other one, reenacting everything, including the Shattered Amulet. But when Shao Kahn declares victory and tries to merge the realms, it finally, officially violates the rules. A bunch of dream demons appear and save Raiden so he can live forever! A newly empowered Raiden is able to defeat Shao Kahn, though not easily, since this boss battles a bitch. After the fight, Raiden sicks the Elder God Eels on the Emperor of Outworld, and they kill him by turning him into a firework. Gods bless Earthrealm. The invasion is over and the amulet is restored, meaning Raiden has saved this timeline from Armageddon. 
too bad everyone's dead anyway. I am responsible for their loss. I mean, yeah, man, kinda. Raiden leaves with Sonya, Johnny, and Liu Kang's corpse, meaning they don't see when Shao Kahn's helm is picked up by Quan Chi. Turns out he's been working for Lord Shinnok this whole time, the Elder God of Death, who's another big bad of the franchise. I'd get into more details, but there will be time for that in Mortal Kombat X, when he's the story's main antagonist. For now, the game ends with this cliffhanger. It is time. Soon I will be free. Earth realm and outworld. Dun, dun, dun. How many combatants got back to the future, back to their graves? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Just as soon as I select my to the numbers, James. All right, let's see here. Uh, not 2017, James. I don't want to play with turbo talking mode on. <laughs> uh, Santa meat, gross. Um, oh yeah, Crazy Ralph James. Oh, I thought I would just become Crazy Ralph me, but... Finish him. What, what, what are you doing? Fix me! You're doomed! Crazy James wins. James Tality. Ah! Huh. That guy is crazy. I counted 148 kills in Mortal Kombat 9, which included nearly every playable and named character and a whole bunch of dead folk in the background. For this pie chart, I'll divide the kills between the 98 background bodies or extras and the 50 named characters I counted, 34 of whom were in that opening scene. As far as who did the killing, nine characters had confirmed kills on screen. Raiden and Sindel tied for the most with eight, Shao Kahn was in third place with four, and all the other killer combatants scored a single casualty with a K each. And if you didn't notice, I can't really do time codes or run times with a video game, so those are all the stats I have for you here in this void. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to all the dead combatants shown in the beginning. Rare that any technically off-screen kills get this award, but this was a great opener and painted such a gnarly picture. It immediately made me excited for the rest of the game. Dome Machete for Lamas kill goes to Cyber Sub-Zero. The whole Sindel massacre is a letdown as it's depicted, but Cyber Subby gets taken out by three punches. And that's it. Mortal Kombat 9 came out in 2011 to huge acclaim, winning several Fighting Game of the Year awards. It put the franchise back in the spotlight, and a sequel followed three years later. If this episode does well, I can look at MKX. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on Mortal Kombat 9 slash Mortal Kombat 2011. The first ever video game Kill Count. We'll have another one for you soon enough though because Chelsea's gonna be covering Danganronpa. Or Danganronpa? I, I don't know how you say it. I don't play it. It's the one with the panda bear principle. Obviously not all video games are going to fit the format of the Kill Count. But thankfully these NetherRealm Studio Mortal Kombat games do. They have a pretty linear story, a bunch of characters die. It, it really works. And I just fucking love Mortal Kombat, dude. This game is fucking hard hard to track down, man. If you've never played it, you're probably not gonna. I had to buy a physical copy and a PlayStation 3 to play it. I think all the digital versions have been removed, I, I think because of the Freddy Krueger rights. Fred Krueger fucking up Mortal Kombat 9. Anyway, if you are a Mortal Kombat game fan, what's your favorite game of the series? And if you're not a fan, did this video make you maybe want to play it? Or at least maybe get into the lore? Thanks everyone. Be good people. Mortal Kombat! I had to do one.